morning. Um, this summer, I studied the, as Dr. Mulder said, the bacterial diversity in the gastrointestinal tract of the pico goat using 16S rRNA gene clone libraries, which, in essence, means determining how we can use bacteria to build a better goat. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'd like to share everything I studied this summer. Uh, ideally, I hope by the end of pr the presentation, I'd at least have con conveyed a few key points. First and foremost, why would anyone spend their summer in a lab studying goat gastrointestinal tract bacteria? Um, the second, once you understand some of the why, I'll share some of the how. Uh, some of the methods used by the scientists to study these types of populations. Um, I'll then give you some of the results of my work to date, and then now that this portion of the project is over, what comes next? Now, while this project is ostensibly about goats, I'm really a microbiologist, and that's the focus of my research. And so I feel like I first need to take a moment to defend bacteria <laughs> from their undeserved, infamous reputation. <laughs> uh, bacteria exist almost everywhere, and they don't just show up to make you sick. Um, they play an important role in many systems, including in nutrient cycles. For example, the largest reservoir of nitrogen is atmospheric, and nitrogen is needed to build proteins and nucleic acids. However, in the atmosphere, um, most organisms don't have access to it, and so nitrogen fixating bacteria can convert nitrogen gas uh, to a form that is accessible at um, through plants and then through them to the rest of the food chain. Bacteria also play a role in uh, developing our immune systems and most importantly for this project, they are essential for digestive health. Um, they manufacture vitamins and help in the breakdown of food stuffs. Now, you know a bit about bacteria, so why goats? Well, goats are a type of ruminant. Ruminants are Earth's dominant herbivores and number about 3.6 billion. Outside of North America, most dairy product is goat derived, and these animals are a growing commodity in underdeveloped countries due to their smaller size and diversified range of forage materials. Um, ruminants are a type of mammal that possess a unique digestive system in which fibrous plant material is processed in two steps by four stomachs. Food is initially softened by the enzymatic and microbial interactions in the first stomach, known as the rumen, after which it is then regurgitated and chewed further before final digestion. And the success of these animals is attributed to their ability to use these symbiotic microbial populations to digest and extract nutrients from this tough cellulose material. Now, despite the strong symbiotic um, relationship between these bacteria and, and, um, and the ruminants, the system is actually not completely efficient. Recent studies have shown that uh, of a, all of the material ingested by the animal, only about 20% is utilized and the rest is lost as waste. However, it is possible to manipulate bacterial populations. We know that probiotics in humans can be used to modulate the um, human GI tract microbiome. If we can similarly modulate the microbial community in ruminants, we can perhaps increase the efficiency of nutrient extraction, leading to a more environmentally sustainable animal product for meat and dairy production, and perhaps better utilization of resources for food and land. Now, while there is a plethora of information regarding cattle rumen, not much information is available on the bacterial symbionts of goats. Therefore, before we can to begin to improve this population, we must first understand the existing microbial community and this is accomplished through construction of a bacterial clone library. So with the resources and time at our disposal, we knew it would be difficult to complete a thorough analysis of the entire digestive system. So we decided to focus our research on two sections of the GI tract. Now the rumen that I mentioned earlier um, is the first and largest stomach and the site of the greatest microbial activity in the animal. And we also decided to look at the rectum, which is at the farthest end of the GI tract. Therefore, our big, uh, big picture project question became, does the microbial community structure in the GI tract of goats vary between goats and between different sections of the GI tract? <clears throat> now, in constructing clone libraries, rather than sequencing entire bacterial genomes, biologists use a section of DNA that encodes for the small part of 
sorry, for a part of a small subunit of the bacterial ribosome known as the 16S rRNA gene. And the 16S genes are the gold standard for bacterial phylogenetic analysis and identification because these are relatively short segments that exist in and are exclusive to bacterial species but have variable regions between species, um, as you can see here. Now, essentially they act as a genomic fingerprint. All bacteria have them, but we can use these variable regions within the sequence to differentiate between these species. Okay. So our collaborators at the University of Kentucky sent us samples from the ruminant rectum of five Kiko goats, and over a summer we were able to process the sections from two of these animals. <clears throat> After receiving our samples, our first step was DNA extraction, which separates out the nucleic acid material from all other cellular material. Unfortunately, this process is a bit imprecise, so it gives us all DNA. Um, goat, plant, bacterial, and anything else that may have been present in the sample. We can resolve this by using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And PCR allows us to target a specific piece of the DNA and quickly and relatively accurately give us billions of copies. And this is actually a step where we can use bacterial-specific primers to target those 16S um, genes that I was talking about. Uh, once we have our 16S RNA amplified, we can, they're all still mixed together in one reaction tube with no real way to differentiate between them. Um, we can solve this problem by inserting or ligating a single DNA piece into a plasmid vector. Um, and vectors are just double, a small double-stranded DNA pieces that are separate from genomic DNA, and one gene piece is inserted into one plasmid. However, since plasmids have no way of replicating on their own, um, and one plasmid is not very viable for analysis, we can then insert a single plasmid into a single specialized E. coli cell in a process known as transformation. This way, we can use E. coli as natural processes to obtain multiple copies of the plasmid. <clears throat> the transformed E. coli cells are then grown overnight on selected media uh, to make sure that the insert is present. And then isolated colonies are selected, cataloged, and then grown overnight in broth culture to obtain huge numbers of E. coli cells. And each of these E. coli cells should in turn also have a huge number of uh, the plasma DNA within them. <clears throat> um, once we have a large amount of plasmid, our next step is to then get that plasma DNA back out of the E. coli cell so that uh, we can then analyze it for sequencing. This, this process is similar to the DNA extraction technique that we used in the first step, but it's specific to plasmids. Uh, we can then use spectrophotometry to measure the concentration of the DNA that is recovered um, before it is sequenced by an off-campus facility. Right. Now, at this stage of my research, we've completed first pass partial sequences of the two, our two goat subjects. So, while the 16S gene is normally about 1,500 base pairs long, the sequences that we received are average about 600 base pairs in length. After we obtained our sequences, we were able to compare them to a known da database and um, use this database to determine the closest related phylum of each clone, as well as generate operational taxonomic units, or OTUs. And OTUs are allow, um, are allow us to do no bacterial clones that have a high degree of similarity and where they can be treated as the same species within our experimental data set. Now, <laughs> So after 10 weeks of research in a lab in summer heat with a sporadically working air conditioner, what do I have to show for all my research? Pie charts. <laughs> lots and lots of pie charts. <laughs> um, as I said, I classified the OTUs into different bacterial phyla. And this pie chart shows the result of all successfully sequenced clones from the ruminants um, fecal samples of the two goats. As you can see, the majority of the clones fell within the phyla, phylum Firmicutes. Um, and this phyla has been shown to dominate clone libraries from other GI systems. Bacteria belonging to this phyla are also known to carry out fermentation of plant matter. And it's these fermentation end products that are then uh, incorporated into animal biomass. 
The next most predominant phyla, uh, Bacter Bacteroidetes, are also dominant in the GI tract of herbivores and humans, and also carry out fermentation. And if you'll notice, uh, together, the <coughs> fermentants and bacter Bacteroidetes make up about 80% of the population that we see. We also found that about 7% of the clones were unclassified when compared with our known sequences, sequences indicating that these could be novel organisms. However, we won't know sh for sure um, until we get our full sequences um, before we can make that determination for certain. Now, in a comparison of our uh, goat to goat, that's um, the ruminant fecal of one goat versus another, we found that subject one has potentially greater diversity than subject two. Um, it includes, it includes um, clones from it includes clones from the phylum Verrucomicrobia and Spirochetes. Um, if you notice, the, uh, in Go Subject 2, their firmicutes seem to dominate. But, um, as you saw on the first slide, the, the total population of firmicutes and bacteroides, when taken together, is still about 80% in both. So, and um, some papers have suggested that these fermen uh, fermentative phylums will compensate for one another so that the fermentative population remains about the same. <clears throat> All right. um, in our rumen to fecal comparison, we can see that there's a more even di distribution and more copper rule distribution of firmicutes, although there is a greater representation of bacteroides, bacteroides in the fecal um, section. So, what's next for this project? Well, my next step is to complete the full-length sequences of the two section, the two goats that I've already um, done partial length sequences for, and uh, then complete the entire process with the three additional animals that I was not able to get to. And fortunately, I have more than ten weeks to do that in this upcoming semester. Um, we'll then also use uh, terminal restrict. Restric restriction fragment like polymorphism to look at the overall <laughs> immunity structure and use that data to statistically analyze differences between goats and segments. <clears throat> and um, I have a lot of people to thank. <laughs> um, of course, I'd like to give a lot of credit to my mentor, Dr. Jenna Mendel, <laughs> for uh, everything she did for me this summer, as well as the ATP program, Office of Undergraduate Research, our collaborator, Dr. Michael Fife at the University of Kentucky, um, Ali Galanis, Kelly Harrington, Dr. Jeff Bowen, obviously Kathy Frederick and Paige Corda, Dr. Rowling, Tara, and Sherry, my lab mates, and um, Isabella and Liz, who were also part of my, my experience this summer. Thank you.